Hello everyone and welcome to TechZone, powered by Axedia, a professional IT services company providing technology consulting and software development for businesses around the world. TechZone aims to shed light on how technology products are developed through the experience of software engineers, product people, UI UX designers and other experts. Each episode covers a specific software development topic ranging from engineering, product, process, quality assurance, or a management viewpoint. Welcome to the Tech Zone. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the BA Tech Zone. Well, over the course of previous episodes, we dived into the deep waters of product management. Today, we want to take a step back into the basics of the business analyst role. On a frequent basis, we get similar questions from potential candidates and friends alike. For instance, I have a decent understanding of what a business analyst does, although this can vary greatly by company and could be a topic of another episode. But how can I become one? And after I become one, how can I develop and progress out of the business analyst role and into other career paths? In today's episode, we aim to cover precisely this. Um, but first, let me introduce Zlatko and Jordan, two of our senior business analysts who are in the studio with me today. We already know them from previous editions of the podcast, but today I'd like to weave the topic into their introductions and ask them how they actually became business analysts and why. Afterwards, at the end of the episode, I'll ask a similar question, but the reverse one, what then what they aspire to be. Zlatko, do you want to go first? How did you become a business analyst? First of all, thank you for having me once again. It's always a pleasure in this company. How did I become one? Well, I didn't become one. It chose me. No. I'm joking here. Um, I studied economics, more specifically finance, and searching for my first job, I saw that the traditional finance roles kind of didn't didn't seem fit for me because I was more or less business oriented, and I always liked the hands-on approach. So I started looking into different directions and. By luck, I would say, I saw a position for an entry-level business analyst and I decided to apply for it. And I didn't know what to expect, but more or less, I would say that by having a problem-solving mindset, the people who were interviewing me felt that I was probably the, the best fit or that's what I would like to think. And that's how I, I got into my first position. Later, I'll share my experience on how I moved through the positions. Jordan, you're next. So my journey with business analysis started a couple of years ago. Uh, initially, I was busy with um, functional documentation and functional specification of, of 3D models. And then this sparked my interest in the world of business analysis itself. Later on, my next role involved delivering um, ERP software, for which I did heavy business analysis, business technical process. And today I'm a proud business analyst in Exedia. Perfect. Thank you. And maybe for the purposes of the discussion afterwards, I can share my experience as well. So I graduated with a business uh, bachelor's and then did a master's in management of information systems, um, then became a consultant um, and then essentially moved on to um, business analysis because I wanted to more narrow focus on specifically delivering um, information systems. Let's let's try to contextualize it in terms of education, in terms of experience, and in terms of skills. What do you actually need to become a business analyst? Maybe as, as a starter for 10, let's discuss education. Um, and I think maybe we can start with the eternal debate, which is, do you need to have an economic or a computer studies background? What, what do you guys think? What is more beneficial for a future business analyst? I, I think um, formal education is needed for the role. I would share that, in my opinion, bachelor's degree is enough to have uh, because of the problem solving and also organizational skills that it gives you. Uh, whether economics or computer studies, it's a bit hard. I don't know. I would think that economic studies is more beneficial of understanding how the business works, how the processes work, while computer studies might give you an edge on the more technical stuff, but seeing how rapidly the magical world is coming, AI is progressing, I, I think it's helping to reduce the need of extensive technical knowledge. 
so you can leverage the technology for your benefit if you studied economics. So would you think a bachelor's degree in economics is enough? It depends. But I would say in mo- most cases, yes. Only in the cases where heavy domain knowledge is needed, I, I would say that probably a master's might suit you better. With a bachelor's degree, you cover most of the most of the cases. Yeah, I think I would tend to agree. I think either if you need heavy domain knowledge or if you want to actually mix and match. So if you, as I did, you can do bachelor's in one of them and then master's in the other and sort of specialize in one direction. Um, but I think a bachelor's on itself is sufficient. Formal education does give you additional problem-solving abilities. It teaches you critical thinking, teaches you teamwork. So I think these are quite essential for a successful business analyst. You can obviously get them elsewhere. You can get them from experience, and I think that's going to be our next topic. Um, But also, I think there's definitely a case of hiring bias that has to be accounted for here. So most recruiters would look for um, at least a bachelor's degree. Um, So um, I think this is worth considering as well. I think, Joran, you had a comment. Yes, about master's degrees, right? So here's the thing. The hiring bias exists. If you take a bachelor's and a master's degree at face value, usually, most of the time, roughly 80%, the master's degree would be preferred. Why? Because it shows you go one step further. However, it really depends on what kind of master's degree you pursue. Because in my case, I pursued a bachelor in general finance. However, I also pursued a master's in economical modeling and business analysis. So I decided to specialize what I was going to be working. In my case, it gives me an advantage over the people with just a bachelor's degree. One interesting thought, we have a distinct difference between us because I have a bachelor's degree and you both have uh, bachelor's and master's. Just to repeat, Jordan has bachelor and master in economics while Bojo has mixed things up. When we look at tendency across um, computer science or probably engineers, there's a tendency that some people prefer informal education in the form of classes, not bachelor's degree. Do you think something similar is possible for a business analyst to do? Or we have the high barrier of the bachelor's degree? What's your opinion on that? So based on reality checks, people look for what you can do, not what you can display on your CV. If you find a way to prove that with external classes or extracurriculum activity, you have managed to find a way to practically incorporate business analysis skills, I think that's fine. If you like that, however, a formal education shows that for a number of years, three or four, you have done some sort of theoretical and practical activity that prepares you for a business analyst role. So it's a bit of an open-ended question. And I think it's um, to the interviewers. But if I were to interview, I would like to see real skills either based on classes or on formal education. But the matter is, can you prove what you can do? naturally the extension of this is then work experience so um if we transition to that topic education shows that you as you said you, you have the basis um, but then what people tend to look for is experience obviously this varies for entry levels um but then um we, we also have the case of people who have graduated something completely different um or who haven't uh, done a bachelor's or a master's um, but then they have experience in certain um, certain industries and, and roles. And then here the question becomes, what do I need to have been to become a business analyst if I'm transitioning from another um, from another profession? So uh, if I'm a developer, can I become a business analyst? If I'm a QA, if I'm a consultant, if I'm a designer, or if I'm a painter, or if I'm an astronaut, can I become a business analyst? Um, so what do you guys think? Are there, are there certain career paths that essentially make it for a smoother transition to business analysis? Um, or is it fairly open-ended and dependent on your skills? And I think, <laughs> I think I've kind of given away my, um, my opinion on it. Um, but Zlatko, you're, you're smiling. As I said, it depends. So this is my favorite answer. Sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> the reality is that roles who are very close to the general business, so let's take the role of the accountant. Accountants usually tend to have a great overview of the business and the processes. They usually 
tend to, to switch roles easier. And looking at the business analysis as, a, as from a more general level, I think that everyone from the roles that you mentioned can transition. It's just dependent on the hard skills they need to acquire. And by hard skills, I mean to understand the, the business, the processes, the relationships, and also have some technical knowledge because we're speaking in the context of an IT business analyst. As to some, some roles where they are quite industry specific, so let's take the astronaut example. Well, that person would definitely perform better in, in SpaceX than any of us. Even though he might lack our hard skills as business analysts, he has a very good understanding of the, the domain. To generalize this as an idea, areas that have a, a barrier of high domain knowledge, subject matter experts tend to switch easier to business analyst roles. By taking the consultant journey for a while, I think this what enabled my transition so well because I had some initial overall business knowledge that I could easily adapt to business specifics. So had I been a developer or a QA, I would have had much more technical awareness of the processes behind the real business. However, I might have, and that's an assumption, I might have lacked some general business process knowledge, which is very vital for a business analyst. So I think the answer is in the middle. Anyone can become a business analyst. What they need to do is to prepare for what the role encompasses. And that's general business knowledge, enablement, and for IT business analysts specifically, a bit of technical background knowledge. That's where I stand. I fully agree. And then to those, I would add a, a set of skills that we, we essentially look for. Um, and so each of us has um, conducted interviews as well. Um, for, for other business analysts um, and we're looking for as you said to my knowledge um, and um, technical background as well potentially um, but beyond that and I think at least for me what what, what I'm looking I, I'm looking for when I'm interviewing is above all two particular skills so problem solving and adaptability um, and maybe that comes as Jordan I have a bit of a consulting background so maybe that comes from there uh, but I think if you have these two qualities, you can basically excel at any aspect of, of the business analyst role. Um, why? Because essentially everything you're trying to do is solve problems for the clients, for the team, uh, whether those are technical issues, whether those are um, uh, external, um, whether those are uh, challenges that essentially block development or challenges that block um, the, the vision of the product. You are trying to optimize, you're trying to solve problems. And the other, the other skill I think is absolutely crucial for business analysts is adaptability. Because often um, we are either thrust into uh, industries we're not familiar with. So as consultants, this happens every time, but also as business analysts in a service company such as Succedia. Um, and you, you have to be able to adapt quickly. So you may never have been in, a, in the automotive industry, but tomorrow you might be on an automotive project. So you need to be able to, within days, um, become an SME, uh, subject matter expert. You need to, e even if you're lacking that domain knowledge, you need to be able to understand where to get it from and digest it quickly and apply it quickly. Even if you're not in the service industry, in the product industry, that's very important as well. Markets change all the time. You need to be able to adapt to different circumstances and different conditions. So I think these are my top skills that I think are crucial for analysts what do you guys think? What's what's something else that people should aspire to um, to essentially gain as a skill? So I would like to hear Zlatko's opinion. Being Exidia's product guy, I would really appreciate his opinion on does product knowledge matter? You got me there. So that's my that's my weak point, definitely. Yes, it matters. That's the the thing that I'm looking for. I'm very much into into product development as we spoke in our last meeting, our last episode. Just to clarify, I'm not looking for a hard skill. So I'm not looking for someone who's into creating roadmaps or various requirement documents or so on. Rather, I'm looking for people who have the product sense, who envision how they can resolve a user's problem by building that product, not the other way around. Finally, I would say that a green flag for me, it's when someone looks at the user's 
problems, tries to solve them, and tries to bring the solution to them so they can bring that value. So that's a big, big green flag for me. I know that our role is more or less connected with the words influencing without authority. And my colleague here, Jordan, he's a big influencer. What's your, what's your thought on that? So I'm a very firm believer on the statement that one of the most powerful things you can do is influence others without having the formal authority. This is how you prove that you're a natural leader. What would without authority mean in our day-to-day -day work? Influence without formal authority would be defined as you being a regular business analyst as opposed to being a lead or a manager or even being on the same seniority scale as, as some of your stakeholders. I believe by having the ability to influence people without necessarily taking up a leadership position shows who you truly are if you state that you're a leader. Because if you can't do so, are you really a leader? Do people really value what you think or what you believe? So I think that's key for me and that's what I look for in people. But number two would be growth mindset. That's a value that we also promote here at our company. That's what we believe in. Throughout the years, my view of growth mindset has evolved so much. I've read a book by Dr. Carl Dweck called Growth Mindset, which essentially taught me how to identify growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset and how to stimulate the development of a growth mindset within a person. One of the best combinations you can have is have a positive influence over people and influence them to obtain the growth mindset. And this is how you create winning teams. O on that note, to create winning teams, I believe that there's just not only special qualities that matter. What about general qualities like communication skills, relationship management, you know, even technical skills? I think, so I was about to, what you said there was really interesting about influence without authority <clears throat> and leadership. Um, if we take a step back from leadership, though, it's, it's as you said, basic skills such as communication and relationship management. I think these are absolutely critical for a business analyst because you you will need to talk to people a lot. So that's, that's going to be your job 80% of the time. Um, you need to be able to relay complex ideas to people who may not be familiar with the specific domain, who may not be technical by nature. Uh, you need to then take their requirements back to more technical people. So you need to be that bridge um, between the business and the technical teams. But beyond that, you need to be able to communicate risks. You need to be able to understand needs. You need to be able to show empathy, um, which I think is also quite critical. These are all qualities that you can't learn from a book and you get those from experience, um, whether this, this is through education and then work with others or through um, uh, um, other endeavors, but it, it's something that you need to definitely nurture. You mentioned technical skills. I think we mentioned it a couple of times. It definitely helps and it definitely, it will make you stand out. What technical skills really help with is twofold. So it's one, you have common language with the technical teams. So if you know um, how a specific technology works, it's a lot easier to discuss ideas, designs, issues, etc. And and inevitably, subconsciously, <laughs> you gain their respect, you know, right? Because you have some understanding of what they do. But then the other thing, it's it's just more convenient. So sometimes it's 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 much easier if you just um, do a database query yourself rather than asking a developer to do it for you. And then you just you save time, yours and theirs. Um, so yeah, I think convenience and also common language. So just to add something on that note, I think me obtaining technical knowledge to a certain degree has tremendously helped our micro team within the project because people need direction. People need reinforcement and people expect it from me. So me having technical exposure to some of the things we do really enabled the team that I work with to perform substantially better. So my bias is that these skills are not 100% necessary. They're a bonus. They're teachable. But if you're willing to learn them, you would be always, always one step ahead of the peers. I tend to agree, but my personal experience is, is a bit different. By personal, I mean work. Uh, in the setup that I work in the product trio, so we've got a separate episode for that. You can go and listen to that. But as a short recap, 
I heavily rely on the tech lead with whom I'm working and also with the designer. So basically my technical input is, is very little, almost to none. So in our case, I even though I have some technical knowledge, I'm not using it because I'm heavily relying on them and we've built the trust on each other that we can take the, the correct decisions as a, as a trio. Very valid point. The thing I want to mention is that it's not really about making technical input rather than understanding what's being delivered to you as technical information. Because remember, communication is a two-way street. So you can't just communicate requirements to the developers without necessarily going into the depths of technical solution, functional, non-functional requirements. So I'm I'm coming from a position where if you understand those and you can communicate them freely with the devs, you enable them to do much better. Obviously, there are technical leads, there are people above technical leads, the technical directors, that said the overall direction of the company where it's headed from a technical perspective. But the role of the business analyst is to understand and relay um, those technical aspects in, in an understandable fashion. Speaking about understanding, how do you think people can understand and learn more about the business analysis role? Uh, we discussed education, obviously, and experience. Um, Jordan, you mentioned a great book, and I think you can share more. Um, beyond that, um, so you can do, uh, there are different webinars, different blogs that, that people can take a look um, at, um, just just general podcasts about technology in general, about specific industries. Um, I think what people sometimes underestimate, successful business analysts understand the industry they work in. Um, and that sometimes come from, comes from general knowledge and from the things they listen to or read. Um, so for podcasts, find a good one which is either specialized uh, on the business analysis topic like ours or um, is a general technology podcast. A podcast I can't recommend enough is by The Verge. It's from their editor-in-chief, Nilay Patel. And essentially what he does is he invites um, C-suite members, so CEO, CTO, CFOs from major, major companies, uh, including uh, politicians, President Obama was on there. So essentially he asks them about their companies, about their organizational structure, how they operate, why they operate the way they operate, um, what do they products do and why, etc. So I think it's really great for just general um, general knowledge about different industries, about different um, models operandi of, of different of different companies. I uh, think Jordan, you you also had a couple of other examples you wanted to share in terms of in terms of different books that people can read. So I'm going to share with you a couple of books that have really helped me develop either personal, interpersonal, and professional skills throughout the years. The first book that I would recommend anyone listening to start with is Mindset by Dr. Carl Dweck. It's really about learning how to grow the growth mindset within you, which would help you become a better business analyst. The second book would be more technically oriented, which is called Mastering the Requirements Process, Getting Requirements Right. The book is by James Robertson and Susan Robertson. It has helped me to understand better what a requirement is, what its life cycle entails. The third book that I would recommend was actually recommended to me by Zlatko, which is called The Mum Test by Rob Fitzpatrick. Essentially, being a business analyst is all about asking questions and synthesizing information. So learning to ask the right type and amount of questions can save you quite a lot of trouble and can propel you forward. And maybe the last book I would suggest to anyone that wants to develop is Atomic Habits by James Clear. We all know that we are what we consistently do, so we might as well improve what we do on a daily basis. We start with the small things that make the biggest difference. Nobody mentioned something about products, so maybe I would need to chime in with a book and a podcast. As a podcast, I would suggest Lenny's podcast. It's all about product and he has various guests starting from very technical people to very non-tech savvy. And I would recommend the book by our favorite author here, I think, Marty Kagan, the book's Inspired. One different approach to improve yourself or to educate yourself is by doing. I would suggest trying something on your own or some kind of a playground as technology emerges more and more the, the cost of development of new products is becoming less and less and it's way easier to develop a project to try or even try out something on our on your own maybe you can try out a blog 
or help an NGO, non-profit organization. More and more organizations are in the need of a business analyst. But I think by looking at Jordan's space, I think he has something to add here. That's very true. And I think you can also look at courses. So maybe sign up for the International Institute of Business Analysis, get an ECBA, the Entry Certificate of Business Analysis, uh, learn through the Business Analysis Bible of Knowledge. And I think this can get you started, really, because it's like a very big book and all of us are familiar with it. Um, and it contains quite a lot of valuable information. Thank you, Jordan. And just to mention uh, for our listeners, so all of the all of the books and podcasts we mentioned, they will be in the notes of the podcast. So we'll you, you can you can essentially uh, get them from there as well. Um, so moving on, then I think um, the other topic we wanted to cover today is find how do you become a business analyst. We covered this, but how do you grow out of the business analyst role? So how do you do develop in it? What what are the career branches there? Um, and I think for the purposes of this podcast, and it's non infinite time boundaries. Um, we will try to apply two levels of abstraction. Um, one, we will divide the possible routes um, into very, very high-level categories, and we've divided them into three. So that's uh, essentially a product role. Um, so that's your product managers, product owners, etc. Then a leadership role. Um, that's your could be a B, uh, BA lead, could be a team manager, could be a project manager, scrum master, engineering manager, and plethora of others. And then there's your advanced role. Um, so this is your business architect, enterprise architect, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think afterwards, our second abstraction level is we will aim to take one row from these three tracks and essentially we'll try to get the most representative ones, um, but also try to point out any other important branches. Um, but again, for the purposes of this podcast, we essentially cover the product manager or owner who is essentially a specialist responsible for the long-term product vision, a project manager um, whose focus shifts a bit to the overall effective delivery of the product rather than the product itself, and the business architect um, whose impact boundaries essentially go beyond the project and with their focus shifting to organizational level processes. Coincidentally and conveniently, each of us um, has one of these roles to heart. Um, so I think Zlatko, you're our product guy. So what can you tell us about the product manager, the challenges of becoming a product manager from a business analyst, and any key skills that you think a product manager should have? The product role, in my opinion, is the most traditional route forward for a business analyst who wants to grow. By product role, as you mentioned, you can have a product owner, product manager, and afterwards you can go into that career track. Um, I think the transition rarely happens from a BA directly to a product manager because there is a big gap. And I think that's where the product owner role comes in. So most frequently that's that's the usual transition through, from a business analyst to a, to a product owner. How do you become a product owner? I would say that there are two main ways. The first one being by certificates. Uh, some of the most um, popular ones being the professional Scrum product owner certificate and also the certified Scrum product owner by Scrum Alliance. Those are the more or less the hard skills that you, you show that you have. The more valuable things to the role are to start taking ownership of the product, also to take responsibility for the outcomes of the decisions that are made about the product, start working with long-term product vision, roadmaps, switch your mindset to a more long-term vision rather than short-term delivery focus. And lastly, I would say that transitioning from a, from a business analyst to a product role is quite hard. If you manage to find a mentor who can guide you through through the dark, it would be the most valuable thing you can do. Courses will get you far, but I think that with mentorship, you can go a lot further. There are two, two more roles that we mentioned. Going into project management or more or less engineering management, I see that as a big challenge. And I would like to hear Bojo's uh, opinion on it. So I think it's definitely slightly different than the rest um, because the focus shifts from the product or from traditional business analysis to um, delivery and to um, people management as well, as well as stakeholder management. Um, and so any business analyst has 
uh, a focus on those things, but with the project or engineering manager, um, the emphasis is even greater. Um, and so essentially at this point, your degree of operational involvement may and will vary. Um, and I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges for me because um, I I like detail as a business analyst and now as an engineering manager, I do like to get involved operationally. I do like to understand how systems works, uh, how systems work, how processes work and why. Um, but then as a as a project manager, sometimes you have to uh, focus on the on the bigger picture, not the operational detail, because you may get lost there and you risk not being able to see the wood for the trees. Um, so this, I think, one of the one of the challenges, and the other one um, as well, is um, if you do care a lot about the product aspect, like Zotko does, um, then going down the project management route may not be your cup of tea because essentially you, your focus will shift from the product to the project. Um, so this is something that you have to take into consideration. If we're talking about skills um, that you need um, and then the path into that role, then if we need to cover certificates, and there are a lot of them, Prince 2 is, I think, the most uh, famous one, um, but not necessarily the best one. There are many, many others uh, out there uh, in terms of skills. I think organizational skills, definitely, I think, maybe Number one for project management, so you need to organize your work, but also the work of others. Uh, you need to guide them through issues and you need to uh, be very careful about um, deadlines, about uh, risks and handling those in the most efficient manner. Stakeholder management by extension, those risks, you need to communicate them effectively. You need to uh, know what each stakeholder needs and wants um, and how um, they can help uh, achieve um, the overall goal of the project and to what degree you need to involve them. And then people management, so same as stakeholder management, but then more directed to um, the actual team members um, within your your team. So what are they, their needs? Um, is their capacity optimal? Is it too much, too little? Are they working on the tasks that they're more suited for? Um, are they happy? And that's something I think that's a lot of a lot of PMs sometimes underestimate people need to be happy and motivated to do their best work. Um, but beyond that, I think if you do like the product aspect, then you either go into product management or um, if you like the process man uh, the process aspect of things, then you can go into the business architect role or lead business analyst role. And I think this is something that um, Jordan has a take on. So I'm going to elaborate on something you said. To be productive, you need to be happy and motivated. For me to be happy and motivated, I need to do meaningful work. For my understanding, a person that does meaningful work is a leader. So I think naturally what I aspire to be is a lead business analyst. Why? Because to me, that's some sort of tactical involvement within an organization where standards are defined, enforced, applied, and they deliver results. So I find happiness in gradually increasing the standards of an organization or a project to an extent where if as a team we say where we were last year is not where we are right now because we're miles ahead. And I think that's done by a person who can lead the team, take the most important out of everyone, stimulate everyone to do their best, and then more. That's why I think the lead BA is one of the most common routes one can take given the fact that they have got some sort of leadership skills within them or they, if they want to develop them. However, from an operational point of view, what a business analyst can become is a business architect where essentially lay the business foundation for any given activity at a certain organization. I think that's also a very important role. However, it really depends to personal preference. As Borzdar mentioned, you are very product-oriented, Zlatko, so I don't see you going any other route. And, and knowing Borzdar for quite a while now, and the way he handles people and the way he handles situation, I think generally the engineering manager role suits him very well. So I think it's kind of pretty fine within you. You just have to look within yourself to find it. That's why I genuinely believe for me, going for a lead BA position would be the best. Because that's what I find passion in doing, creating standards, enforcing them, constantly improving them. I, I find happiness in seeing other people grow. So that's why I think people need to start looking within themselves to identify their next step and possibly outline their next few moves. 
Speaking of next moves, I think that that's a brilliant way to actually close out this podcast. So you, you already mentioned um, what you aspire to be. From my perspective, I think uh, it's going to be finding that happy medium between, as you said, project management and product management, which are difficult to coexist, but they can coexist, I believe. And that's something that um, I aspire towards. Vladko, from yours, what do you want to achieve in the next few years, decades? As I said, transitioning from a, from a BA to a, to a product role, you have to switch to the long, long-term long mindset. And that's my far answer is that I want to see how my product portfolio will play out in the long run, how the decisions or the path that we take today is going to play out in the next year and whether we can achieve the impact that we are striving for seeing the, the the outcomes that we managed to achieve with our decisions. And I'll be honest here, I don't believe that everything we do now will play out positively. And I'm, I will be there to take, out, to take the responsibility and to take the learning. If I can leave the listeners with anything, it would be to keep going, learn, explore, try new things. You'd be tremendously surprised by the things you're good at that you just haven't found yet. Try a BA role, try any role, learn more, learn how to do more and then apply it. And it's not necessarily for for the business analyst role as we speak. What I found during my journey is that the more I the more value I provide, the better I become and then I spread my horizon so much more. So I would definitely be something that I would recommend to to our listeners. And I think we couldn't hope for a more positive and inspirational ending so i would like to thank you guys for um joining me today on the podcast to our listeners if you like this today then please absolutely do subscribe um we we have other uh, business analyst episodes we do cover a, a range of other topics as well um so do follow us on all of the imaginable channels and lastly if you'd like to collaborate then please do get in touch um we're more than open to ideas we're more than open to um, having discussions uh, with people outside of the organization as well um, so um, this is something that we are absolutely open to this is the end of the episode if you enjoyed it follow us on spotify apple podcasts or any other audio platform subscribe to our youtube channel via the link in the description of the episode so you can explore more and stay tuned for all the video content we produce thanks again and goodbye from us